your comments and input. Before we jump in, I'd like to hand over to uh, my friend Mark Hamill, the CEO of Arquette Global, to give us a few words. Absolutely, and thank you so much, Marlon, for the intro. Um, I'm just going to say a very brief bit about the North American Customer Centricity Awards. Uh, we have one week left to go for the registration deadline, so anyone that's interested in participating, um, all you would have to do is fill out a simple form on the, on the website, and you'd have two weeks to submit any documentation. So. Um, hopefully we can welcome you all there uh, to be part of one of the biggest celebrations of customer centricity across the Americas. And I'm just going to hand you back to Marlon to take you through the rest of the session. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Mark. Really exciting. Uh, we just enjoyed the World Series and look forward to the uh, North American uh, event coming up quickly. Well, today's topic is going to be focused on the importance of recognition in customer experience. And I'm joined today a uh, great privilege to be joined by some experts in the field uh, that we'll all have a, a, an opportunity to interact with. Uh, so this morning, I'm joined by Mr. Rick Denton, the managing principal of a company called EX4CX, Employee Experience for Customer Experience. I look forward to talking to you, Rick, and uh, welcome to the, to the event today. We also have Diane Majors, who I think will be joining us shortly. Uh, who is the former CEO of the CXPA and founder of uh, Experience Catalyst. Uh, many of us have worked with Diane and she's a wealth of knowledge. I enjoy uh, discussions with Diane. And last but not least, uh, joined by my friend Alec Dalton, the Senior Manager of Global Quality at Marriott International. Enjoyed speaking with uh, Alec at the World Series. And Alec, welcome to the event this morning. So as we get into the discussion, um, remember that uh, we're going to ask a few questions. You can use uh, the forum, the chat, uh, to enter questions that you'd like us to ask or address, or you can speak up uh, and, and share your thoughts uh, live with us as well. But let's just jump right into it. And uh, Rick and Alec, you know, as we start talking about um, the importance of recognition, in CX. Let me just start with this. Let's define it. What are we talking about? Um, when we talk about recognition, is that like the employee of the month parking space? Uh, is, is that a, a piece of paper in the cubicle? Or, or what are we talking about when uh, we hear recognition? I'll jump in there if you don't mind, Rick. I think the cool right. thing about recognition from a CX standpoint is that it it checks off the all of the above option and the menu you just presented, Marlon, and then some. We have recognition from our employees uh, and for our employees, certainly, making sure that they're appreciated and acknowledged. We certainly need to recognize our customers. That's the foundation of building loyal two-way relationships. And then organizations, of course, have the opportunity to get recognized and to develop their marketability. That's where organizations like Arquette come into play and can uh, help organizations amplify their value. There's so many great ways uh, to think about recognition. I'm curious for Rick's perspective on this. Yeah, and uh, so that's, I, as I was listening to Marlon, the way you, you phrase the question, I'm sitting there going, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And exactly what Alex said, it's all the above. And I, I like the, the thought of, you know, amplifying those three categories. Yeah, I, I think of recognition as, as whatever entity is recognizing another entity. It's a human to human, a company to company, whatever it is. What you're trying to do is just highlight what is valued. And so you're making a declarative statement that this is what I value and I'm recognizing you for delivering what that is valued. And I think that's so important to helping a company establish its culture, a company establish its brand, uh, engage its employees, motivate its employees. Uh, the, the idea that recognition has to just be perhaps like a dollar, right? A lot of times we hear that recognition is a monetary, something along those lines. It really doesn't have to be. It's whatever is making this statement of appreciation and acknowledging you've done something that we value and we thank you for delivering what was valued there. Doesn't have to be complex. Could just is a statement. You've done something we value. I love that. I love that. So, so as we talk through it, then let me ask this question. Who, who is, you know, a lot of times when we talk about CX, we, we think about who owns CX in an organization. Well, as, as we flip it and now we start to think about the employee, I ask you the same question. Who owns the employee experience programs in an organization? It, 
see rock, paper, scissors, Alec, to, uh, see, to see who goes Marlon. first. Oh, there's Diane, too. So maybe <laughs> Diane. You know, Marlon, I'll, I'll start with this, but I, I really want to hear Alec and, and Diane on this. There's an element of same answer. Everyone does. And I know that's always the, well, if everyone does, then no one does. Not exactly. Uh, the employees themselves own employee experience because there really isn't this concept of employees and non-employees, right? So there is this sense of the the entire employee experience isn't owned by the entire employee base. And I know that's not the most tactical or transactional thing, but starting with that spirit of we all own this and not that I'm expecting someone else to engage me or that I'm expecting this other group to manage the employee experience for my team or whatever that might look like. We all do. Now, I really would love to hear kind of thoughts of, okay, so great. That's ethereal and, and wonderful. And we can, you know, cross our legs and hum a bit, but how do we, who really owns the experience when it comes to the tactical nuts and bolts could be interesting. Yeah. And I think, from, you know, building onto that, tactically speaking, you obviously have HR functions that can support the processes and the policy governing how employees interact with the business and vice versa. Um, but I think it oftentimes comes down to departments like customer experience or like quality management, um, certain aspects of the organizational um, structure side of human resources that can um, clarify the way that company values, which everybody should share and, and ideally would be a part of creating. Uh, they can translate those into other systems and processes that the organization exhibits. I'll give you a really good example. Literally, I've got a piece of paper here from the Ritz-Carlton. It's called a first class card. I used to work um, in several Ritz-Carlton hotels and at the corporate office before transitioning into the broader Marriott portfolio. And the essence of these cards is really simple. If you recognize another lady and gentleman for doing something great to deliver phenomenal service to a guest or to a coworker, Anybody doesn't have to be a leader. It can be another frontline associate. It can be anybody across the organization. It could be our CEO. They'll write a simple note on the first class card, hand it over. And like Rick was saying earlier, it doesn't cost any more money than printing this piece of paper and taking a couple of moments to do so. But the impact is profound. Uh, as I've seen uh, the team members retire from the company or transition to other groups, the first class cards are one of those things that always ends up in their transition box that they take with them from one place to the next. They collect them. And, and I think, again, that speaks to the great power of recognition. But it happens because the HR organization, mm -hmm. you know, had the gumption to provide those cards mm -hmm. to create framework leaders embody that and and religiously present first class cards to their team members so there's expectation setting from different parts of the organization yeah it's a great example that's a great example now now alec um i'd like to stay with you for just a second because mm -hmm. uh during the world series you gave a great presentation uh and, and you and i had an opportunity to have some dialogue around different customer experience programs across um different geographies and different parts of the portfolio right and marriott's a great example of that how does that translate into employee programs that's a great example with uh, the ritz carlton but do you, do you have the same program across the portfolio or do you have to dis differentiate that based on the offering and the geography that's a really great question marlon there's a lot of consistency as we look across brands and frankly, a lot of them borrowed from the Ritz Carlton methodologies as we expanded our, as we incorporated that into the Marriott portfolio and then kind of proliferated it. So um, uh, within global operations, for example, where I sit, we don't have first class cards, but we have go getter cards, go for global operations. Um, there are, for each of our brands, we have distinct core values. We have typically a pocket card that employees have as part of their uniform with uh, what you might consider the steps of service for that brand, phrased in language that's specific. Uh, a great example of this most clearly would be the fact that I've already said that uh, at the Ritz-Carlton employees are called ladies and gentlemen, as many in CX know. Within the W brand, we call them talent. Within Gaylord, they're called stars. So even from a verbal standpoint, uh, the way in which we talk about employees and, and don't just call them employees, but give them some, some pride in their role uh, and in their partner and organization is again, itself a, a great form of recognition. That's, that's great. Um, how, how, about, how about geography? And, and mm -hmm. I don't know how many on the phone we have uh, that cover multiple geographies, but um, I think if, if you're in global business, 
I think it's recognized that different cultures recognize people differently. Um, and so what have you seen in terms of dealing with, with cultures or parts of the world where commendation is not natural? It's almost unnatural. How do you right. address that? You know, at the end of the day, I think a key aspect of great recognition is delivering a bit of personalization to that experience. It's one of the foundational principles in, in CX altogether, I think. And, you know, you pose that interesting challenge in hospitality. We have guests coming from all over the world to stay in a location. At the same time, that destination has its own culture and identity. The employees who work there may be coming from different places and backgrounds. And apart from, you know, the culture and ethnicity and, and everything socioeconomic about those three, you also have the brand identity coming into play on top of it all that has some type of value associated with it in the mind of guests and, and employees alike. And so there's always an interesting dynamic at play. And when we introduce our associates, especially those on the front lines of service, think a front desk agent, for example, or a waiter in a restaurant, um, a core part of their training is understanding the, the brand's spirit of culture so that they can represent you know, a Ritz Carlton versus a W versus a Renaissance or a Residence Inn. At the same time, we're hoping that they represent their locality where the hotel is at so that the guest does indeed feel welcome to this special place they're traveling to. But we're always conscious about the culture of the guest. And there are different cues and, uh, and observations that we train our, our associates to make so that if they notice that um, the way they're interacting with the guest is causing slight discomfort for the guest, they'll, they'll adapt and change. And there are certain geographic patterns that might go into that so that we're uh, at the end of the day respecting people's cultures and their identities um, while doing our best to provide those unique experiences that we think they've come to stay with us to, to enjoy. That's fantastic. Rick, you agree? Yeah, I'm sitting here just nodding left and right. It, one of the things that I heard coming loud and clear out of what Alex said there in answer to your question, Marlon, was, well, listen. And we talk a lot about listening to our customers, but in this case, listen to our employees, listen to their culture, listen to who they are, what their experiences are, what, what motivates them, and use that to drive your recognition. So if this over-the-top, goofy celebration that I have found to motivate you know, employees at Capital One in my past with balloons and whatever that might look like, and that might bring some embarrassment to cultures around the world and not want it to be so individualized, but rather maybe maybe not an individual celebration, but let's focus more on the team or find something more muted that honors their culture and their style. It's really important to not assume that just because I celebrate boldly here in the West, that's something that everyone around the globe wants to celebrate in that same way and recognize in that way. So being sensitive to that is what I heard Alex saying through and through, and it's so important to getting recognition right in a global perspective. Great idea. Great ideas. Great feedback. So here's a question from, from the audience that kind of, kind of follows that. As we're thinking about programs, what do you feel is more valued by employees? The one-on-one -on -one to recognition, like the first class card, or more public recognition in front of a peer group? I'll, I'll, come, I'll comment on that one because I, I, listening to the conversation, I was also nodding my neck is broken as well. Um, <laughs> that uh, I think if we, if we step back for a minute and really think about our approach to personalization for clients and that understanding of who they are, their needs, wants, and expectations, and, and their personal um, approach to what they get from a brand, uh, I don't think it's any different for employees. Um, knowing and understanding them, listening to the way that they receive. So what works for one what the, might not work for the other. There are people who do not want the recognition. Don't put my name out anywhere. I'm happy if my coworker says I did a great job, but I do not want the notoriety, right? I'm not, I'm not out there to do that. Versus other folks who want the visibility, who really gravitate toward that and want that kind of celebration effect. So I think we have to understand them. I mean, it's really no different in principle than saying, how do we personalize that for them? Um, and then to your point, Rick, I, I totally agree with you. I, I kind of always say, you know, you need to take charge of your own career. Um, and that's important because they're expressing their needs and saying, I need upskilling, I need more support, I need, whatever those are. But it's the leadership, regardless of who that is, the leadership's role to hear that and put actions against it. And not just the fuzzy, let's get a new, you know, more training in here, but really what are they saying? 
It's not really upskilling. What is it? It's contributing and being more valuable to the organization and growing their own career, right? We need to get to that, that human need so that we really understand what to build and not just try to put those more bag buy more bagels, as I call it, go beyond the bagels. Um, what is it really that we're trying to accomplish with what we're doing? So I think there's some element of don't just go do to do for doing sake, but really step back, think about personalization, how you're taking those needs and really translating them to the right problem to solve. And you said something so vital there, Diana, and, and I may not have the exact words, but the theme of, hey, don't just do a bunch of fluffernutter with the values. You've got to actually do something with it. Um, and and that's something that we have seen fail as a fail so often. I know I've been in companies that are that, that I've got the really nice placard, uh, Alec, not any of the, the Marriott brands or anything like that, but I've been a part of companies that I've had the value slapped on the back of my badge. And we even, I was at a company where there was a test that the CEO would call random numbers. He'd call you know, 15 desk phones, right? This is back in the day of desk phones mm -hmm. per day. And you'd be quizzed on the values. And if you didn't know the values, then there would be some sort of punishment associated with that. That was the exact opposite of creating and inspiring and engaging employees. And so I realize we've deviated, I'm, I'm taking us a little away from the recognition aspect of it, but that idea of doing something that, first of all, stating the values, but then doing something that's in line with what those values are is so important. Otherwise, it's just lip service or fluff or nutter. So, so Rick, let's, let's stay with you for a second on that topic, because if, if that's, if we go down that path, then, then the question becomes, so what is the, what is the greatest impactful outcome? What, what's, what, what does an employee want? And again, that's, that's kind of a general question, but how right, do you that, tailor the outcome to something that's meaningful to the employee when they're getting recognized? Well, I think we've been talking a lot of, of that already. And first of all, it's, it's an element of trying to understand your employees. And the, there is, I guess we need to do take perhaps one step back. There is the realization that you can't do something absolutely personalized to each individual's personality or something along those lines, right? So it's it's getting a sense of perhaps your employee community and understanding is the big, bold, brash celebration the good thing or is it the more quiet, personalized one? Even going back to the question that was asked here in the chat, which is more valued by employees, the one-on-one -on -one recognition or the public recognition, I'd almost say put your hands together and it, it, it is possible to have that one-on-one -on -one recognition and have the public if it's what your employee or your employees uh, seek. Uh, there's an example that uh, we used. To, I'm, I'm referring to Capital One quite a bit here in some of the examples that I'm thinking of. I mentioned the balloons, but we had a concept called fan mail and we actually – elevated the employee's ability to brag on themselves. There was this culture of, oh, I don't, I, I had a really great customer call. I had a really delightful customer interaction, but they kept it themselves. And then we didn't get the, we meaning the company as a whole, didn't get the benefit of enjoying and celebrating it. But then we didn't get the, the benefit of celebrating that particular employee. And so we created the concept of fan mail that if you got a customer that bragged on you, just flip it, just forward it to, uh, I think it was fan mail at Capital One or whatever it was, right? And we then, there was a team associated with that. We print that out, put that up on the wall, celebrate you. And then every day as people walked in, they would see this wall of fan mail that was both celebrating what the company had done for that individual, but then also what the employee had done for the individual. It elevated the employee, but then going back to that first point of it, recognized or reinforced what the company values. Every day walking by, there was a reminder of this is what the company celebrates because we were recognizing that individual. Man, I have no idea if I answered the question. I think I just got on a soapbox and just completely lost. And uh, James Joyce there for a second. <laughs> well, actually, I, want, I want to jump right onto what you were saying, Rick, because uh, one of the, the things that um, I 100% agree with it and would add, we also need to think about what we're recognizing. Yeah. Not just how we're recognizing and, and you know, whether we're uh, offering those, you know, broad celebrations or those individualized one-on-one -on -one quiet in, in, in the hallway or pat on the back, but um, what gets recognized so often speaks to what an organization actually values. Is the organization just giving out recognition when you hit your five, 10, 15 year service anniversaries with the classic plaque pin in a parking spot? Or is the organization celebrating accomplishments of a huge project and not the day-to-day -day work, which you know is, is also not a perfect scenario? Um, how can organizations create some sustainable recognition throughout an employee's journey? Um, so that at the end of the day, I think this is the, the, the goal, so that employees feel appreciated 
you know, acknowledged as individuals, thanked for their contributions, encouraged to contribute more, and continuously developed along the way so that they can can upskill and add greater value to their own lives and, and back to the company. That's great feedback. That's great feedback. Let, let me let me pause for a second. Um, are there any specific questions from the audience that you'd like to ask uh, the panelists? Appreciate the questions coming through the chat window. Marlon, while they're while they're doing that and thinking, I'll I'll weigh in since we're pinging pinging the ball around here. Um, I also think there's a a why to that. Um, why are you recognizing employees? Um, I think employees have begun to to have because we've been talking about employee experience and employee engagement in different ways. And if it's, I'm doing this because I want my employees to have discretionary effort, or am I doing it because I want the employee to feel valued um, and a contributor and, and listen to their ideas and use those ideas? Um, I think there's an important part of um, the why. And it can be lots of reasons, but I think if you're not crystal clear on why you're doing it and what value it's going to bring to the person, um, whether it's a leader or a frontline employee, um, then I, I think you should go back and question it because I see a lot of recognition programs that are just a layer of icing on top of the cake and you ask about what impact did it have, nobody can tell you. We, yeah. we just do it for good. And I'm cool if you're doing it for good and it gives people a you know, good warm feeling, but you also need to make sure it's adding that value to Alex point, adding the value to the human who's receiving it and the value to the organization. Gosh, I, I, I really like that because that, that gets it. We were talking earlier, right? The, you know, is it just a dollar incentive or something like that? And I think asking that why question helps company make that choice of the why drives the how, of course. And if you're looking to just get a flash in the pan result, like the why is, hey, we we just want to increase sales by a particular quarter. Well, then maybe you throw some money at it from some bonuses. Or, but if the why is, as you're describing, you know, is it really getting into uh, the company's values into the hearts and the minds of the employees so that they embrace the brand and then are able to deliver that brand experience out to the customer? Well, that's going to take a completely different approach to recognition. And yeah. starting with the why unlocks that path forward. Yeah. We, we did that with um, an organization that um, they wanted collaboration was really one of their outcomes. That was, the, that was you know, they knew that they recognized that their build, and building in their silos was creating issues. And it, was, and it was a rub for the employees too. Like they felt they wanted to think bigger, but they weren't given the opportunity to. So when we started to do cross team workshops and we got, you know, a few projects underway that were cross-functional, we celebrated that and recognized the people who contributed to that. And I think that was a move toward, it doesn't have to be something that's specific about the employee. It can be about the organization moving forward. Um, so the recognition of that began to say, people said, well, wow, I wanna do that because I, I've always felt like um, I wanted to think bigger and connect the dots, but I never had a chance to. Now I see the organization is recognizing the importance of that, that jazzes me up and I'm gonna start doing that and volunteer. So it was also the driving um, that, that importance of we're listening and responding to your frustration of not being able to broaden your skill set, um, some of those other whys behind it, and getting them the what's in it for them. You know, that you, because of this cross functional team, people learn more about other parts of the organization. That's pretty cool because we're building your skill set and we're developing something better for the organization. So don't think about recognition just being that employee and what they did, but also how the organization works. Because that recognition of the shift and the move to something different is what employees really want to see. Are we keeping up with today <laughs> and, and what's happening in the future? They want to, they want some confirmation that's happening. So double, double bonus, right? You get to talk about that and you get to highlight how employees made that happen. That's great. And, and Diane, if, if we could stay on that theme for a second, there's a great question in the chat uh, from uh, Mr. Estrada. Does recognition come when an employee does everything he, supposed, he was supposed to do outstandingly? Or is it when they do something they were not supposed to do, but they were proactive? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll do a plus one on the yes. <laughs> there, there's two. That's there you go. There you go. And, and sometimes that's the tricky thing I think about recognition programs. They can get overcomplicated yes. in what gets recognized. 
And, and I think very much is all of the above. And you have to, and I think this is where a leader has a responsibility to foster those relationships with each of the members of their team. If you see that there's a member of your team who seems to have a slight decline in, in recent performance, that'd be a good opportunity to connect with them and, and just do a pulse check. See, how are you doing? Is there something that I can do to, to help you, um, you know, conduct your work better? Is there something that's happening right now in your life that I can help with? I've observed a change in your performance and I just want to make sure that things are okay. On the flip side, if you've got a stellar employee, you know, you should absolutely give them a pat on the back, give them that reinforcement. Uh, if it's something that you think they would appreciate uh, to, to again, uh, congratulate them on that work and to keep that, that spirit going. I always think back to that famous quote from Peter Drucker, what gets measured gets managed. And measurement doesn't just have to be a, about a quality control system counting things within a database. It, it can often be about those observations that leaders make about the performance of their team or about even relationships with their customers to say, hey, I, I need to lean in a little bit here or a little bit there to keep all of the, the plates spinning, so to speak. Yeah, so, Ali, that, oh, sorry, Marlon. No, go ahead, Rick. I was going to say that we're talking about recognition. I think a lot of folks think capital R recognition, right? It's the formal recognition program. And there's a, a question in there that I think we'll want to talk about kind of the, you know, how do we cross boundaries between groups when it's recognition, employee recognition, there, the example you just provided of, Hey, let me check in with you, that kind of thing. Well, that's recognizing the employee that is getting at the heart. And, and even just that conversation itself can have more of an impact than the certificate than can the, the monetary, but because my, my team cares about me and is engaged with me, I, I saw this at a, a prior client that had gone completely remote uh, before COVID. So this was pre COVID, they went completely remote and their employee engagement had gone in the tank. And one of the things that they realized was there was not that organic check-in that they had when they were sitting together as a physical call center. And so they had to develop a discipline around doing exactly what you're describing, Alec, which is just reaching out. And so it's it may fall under engagement or what it might, but it, it is still recognizing that that employee exists as a human and, and, and is doing everything they can to be attentive to that humanness to help them. I, I love that. And I think there's a lot of things if we think about neuroscience and psychology coming into play here. Um, we talk about the halo effect of if people, you know, you do something unexpected and you come to an employee and say, you know, I recognize, I saw you do this and I recognize that. And I really want to say that I appreciate it. Totally unexpected says that he, they're paying attention to you. And that halo effect of I'm, if I'm being watched and, and I'm really getting some of that, I'm, I'm probably going to do things differently. I know I'm being watched. That's part of that halo effect. But it's also that reinforcement. So recognition and reinforcement of the behaviors you're looking for. And I don't want to make it sound scientific, but if an employee is doing something well and you just take it for granted, it's not going to continue. You're not perpetuating that behavior or the emotions tied to that recognition and um, I think that's another piece we really have to be purposeful about how we give that recognition and when. It's become too expected in some organizations of if I do these things, I'm going to get recognized. Mm -hmm. It's the unexpected today that really begins to, you know, that's what we're all after. So those moments of a gear grinding in a positive way of, wow, that was kind of unexpected. We're all kind of looking for that. So I think turning it on its head a little bit and not having so much formality is also important. So. Exactly. I can't tell you how many memes I've seen over the last couple of weeks, uh, especially as people think about returning to offices, uh, about uh, the, the enormous disdain for quarterly pizza parties. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. It's like, yeah. oh my if God, I have to go. Companies want their employees back in the office. Companies need to, I think, rethink what their priority is. Yeah, do I have to go? Yeah. I have to go. <laughs> Diane, oh, there. If we stick with what you said around unexpected uh, outcomes, Todd has a question here that I kind of think parlays into this around how do you how do you recognize failure? Uh, you don't always get what we expect and plan or formalize, but even when the employee does everything right and and we still have a miss, is that an opportunity to still recognize an employee? What would you say? Did you aim that toward me? Um, I, I think it's the recognition of effort. And I would say if they did everything possible and something else was in their way, I think it's important to identify the obstacle. 
whether that's something from them where they don't have the right tools and resources or hey they they weren't able to really satisfy the client because they got upset um and emotionally because they were kind of absorbing what the, the client did for example or a salesperson who you know doesn't do a good job at a, a business review well, whatever that is where they missed expectations even though they had it i think you still have to recognize but it's it's always the um let's recognize where we were but let's put something in place to to overcome that let's really diagnose what happened together so that we can put some things in place and then um, the things that are put in place to be able to go back and look at that and and help them identify did that work for you in a different way I love that, Diane, how you're talking about, you know, recognizing, hey, what was the barrier to that person's success and, and acknowledging that and in that vein, I, I, I would want to add two things to that. And one is have fun with it, right? If the company culture supports it, it's okay to have a biggest failure award. If that's kind of something that can be celebrated into and here's what we learned about it, right? Not just a pure mockery or a roast or anything along those lines. But I've been a part of cultures where that's absolutely some product was released and it was an absolute flop. And and we celebrated and ha 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 about that flop. But then here's what we learned about it type thing. But I'd offer a big caution to that is what I led with. If the culture supports it, we talked about globally, how we need to be cognizant of what that uh, recognition and what that might look like globally. There are, and we all know this, there are cultures where that would be absolutely toxic and the worst idea that I could possibly voice and we should edit it from the recording. So I think it, it, it is mm -hmm. possible to have fun with it, but only in the right situations. And I've seen those situations, but to be aware of where they are. That's See, great. But one bit that I would add there, I love the, the kind of the root cause analysis, the quality framework that you've both spoken to so far. Uh, I think a, a really powerful question is always, how can we prevent this from happening again? Another way to, to frame a question or to, to make a statement uh, is um, this might be even better if. So let's say that the employee, maybe they didn't make a, a fundamental mistake. Maybe their output wasn't wrong, but it just wasn't great. Um, have that conversation with them, share your perspective, especially as a leader, it's always important to remember that those who are working on your team may not have had the same experience, tenure, exposure, et cetera, that you have had over the course of your own career. And so use those as those teachable moments. Um, share a perspective and do your best to defend it with fact or again with anecdotal experience. So it's not just like, oh, I like, you know, my PowerPoint slides blue instead of green. Mm -hmm. Explain why and do a little bit of a demonstration, even if appropriate, to help the employee um, cultivate those skills and reinforce those skills. And, and, and I'll, I'll um, underscore and underline reinforce. Don't just acknowledge that one time it happened. Make it sustainable. Con yeah. you know, and don't talk about it every day, right? You, you don't need to work on it. But over the course of time, make observations, give the person a pat on the back or clap when they follow what, what has been guided and comment when the lesson hasn't been learned. Yeah, it's a great I idea. love the, um, the positive spin on that. And I think if we, I hark back to um, a technique, if anybody's looking for something, how do I really go do that? I, I talk about looking for opportunity and Ricky said, you know, yes, things didn't go well, we learned from that. But there's a technique called appreciative inquiry where you're actually looking to celebrate what went right and what, when are we at our best as an organization? What does that look like? Let's recognize when we're doing and what we do well, because so many, so many times it's about the continuous improvement and root cause and we're looking for problems. Are we really taking the time to just out of the blue sometimes really celebrate that? Yeah. Um, so especially when we're talking about strategy, um, that's when I've used that appreciative inquiry. You can go look it up. There's lots of resources on the web, um, but it's a great way to start off with, you know, what's going well. And, and how do we really celebrate that and things we don't want to lose as we make changes. So let's not design ourselves out of the things that really work well. Um, so that's a great technique if you're wanting something that's hands-on to start yeah. looking also for where you can recognize your employees. We do this well because our employees do X. Out of the blue, it's great to tell them that. It's a great thought. We're at the half hour. Let, let me, let me pause. We got several questions and thank the audience uh, so much for, for your input and questions coming into the forum. Uh, before we go to those questions, uh, I'd just like to try to open it up to the audience. Is there any, any discussion from the audience um, or questions you'd like to verbally ask the panel? 
Don't be shy. It's Friday. We don't bite. No questions. Well, not, to not today anyway. <laughs> this is Kate. Can I make a comment? Hey, Kate. Good morning. Hey, Kate. Good morning. So I don't have a question, but I attended a similar webinar yesterday about recognition and work at home guru uh, Vicki Brackett shared that she has done something with her teams that I really liked. And that is that she makes a list of agents that she wants to recognize, but she will trade that with another supervisor so that one supervisor or another supervisor trade those lists and they're calling those agents over a period of several days just to say, hey, I was just talking to your supervisor and they said you were great at whatever it was. And I loved that idea because that's just another way of increasing cohesion in the team and promoting the company culture. I, I yeah. love that so much. And what I think is especially valuable is that in the day and age of remote work, exposure of employees, especially to leaders, is incredibly challenged. Um, one way that you might slightly alter that is by having, uh, let's say, you have an employee, you have their manager, and their manager's manager do that same exchange so that kind of that second level up manager sends a note or uh, at Marriott oftentimes we'll get mailed a, a note card from from those more senior leaders to say hey I heard this from your leader kudos to you it's such a fantastic way to generate exposure that's awesome thank you for sharing that Kate. yeah that, I really like what the, the the idea that you're sharing there Kate because for those of us that have children uh, how, how much do we realize that our children often listen to what somebody else says, even if it's the same thing, but different than what we as the parents say to them, right? So exactly. even even when it's it, discipline, but then praise coming from someone else sometimes even means more than coming from the parents. So I love that idea of sort of switching the where the, the voice of recognition is coming from. The other thing that was woven into what you said there almost goes back to something Alex said, Alex said at the very beginning, and it's there's a discipline to what you're describing. So for that to be successful, there needed to be the concept first generated the concept, but then the structure and the operation, the execution to make it happen. And so often these ideas of the recognition programs that may feel ad hoc or organic take a lot of discipline and execution behind them. And, and it sounds like from what you're describing in that story, that was a key part. And I know that's a lot of what's driving the success in that space is not just the one-off, but the repeatability and of that and, and having that be demonstrated over time. So Kate, we're not gonna steal that idea from you. We're going to borrow that idea from you. <laughs> well, again, the, the, credit goes to, the credit goes to Vicki Brackett. That one wasn't mine. <laughs> Speak for yourself. I'm stealing. I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> she won't mind. Hi. This is Hank. I've got a question. Hey, Hank. Good um, morning. Morning. I, I love that uh, those of us in CX are talking about the employee experience. Uh, in, in a recent keynote, uh, I talked about a, a vision where I see HR and CX combining organizationally. Uh, we each have um, competencies that the other can benefit from. You know, the employee experience is very similar to the customer experience in terms of steps. We market to them, we close them, uh, we onboard them, we service them, and we account. Uh, so the experiences are the same, and so HR can benefit from our competency of mapping. But HR typically kind of owns driving culture, and customer centricity is a cultural play. And so we in CX can, can borrow and use that competency. And so to me, uh, I see five, 10 years down the road, the disciplines and, and departments of CX and HR combining to a to go from customer and employee experience to people experience and curious your thoughts on that. That's a great question. Uh, hi, this, hi um, this is Lou. I just wondered, the uh, question that I have is uh, the idea of leadership recognition as we move more and more toward flat organizations and teams it would appear that peer recognition and in situations where I've seen peer recognition as opposed to leadership at a boys, but peers recognizing peers uh, being extraordinarily powerful. Do you see a shift in what's beginning to happen in the way that organizations are looking more at creating teams versus command and control organizations? This, this, those are great questions. So maybe we can take them one one at a time. Um, so so uh, Lou, come right back to you. 
Hank, to your question, what does the audience feel about the, the employee customer experience departments coming together? Is that something you're seeing in the industry? Uh, actually, even seeing uh, situations where HR is becoming part of a marketing group uh, and reporting to marketing in service industries where your employees are actually your biggest marketing asset. Uh, I, I'd encourage um, folks to read Accenture's latest um, paper on the business experience of business, the business of experience, I think is what they call it. What, what they're proposing is, um, is that experience will become integrated in, into all components of the business. So yes, employee and customer, yes, supplier and partners, um, but really back to that human um, element we talked about. But the importance of that is when we think about experience being embedded into products or services or supply chain or any other component of the business, um, we're really instilling it there too. Um, now to the point of how is that organized, I see, see two things. We see experience leaders, period, which means it doesn't matter what experience it is, that it becomes a part of their role. And I totally agree with you that HR and CX, that if you just turn the lens of CX onto employees, you should be doing the same thing all the time, listening, personalization, employee data platforms, why not their customer, the brand themselves. But we're also seeing this shift to your point about organizations. I have a nonprofit that is back East, um, medium-sized nonprofit, and they are going through an organizational shift to become more experience centric. And it's not the silos. It's how do we organize ourselves around this, this change and how we really need to work. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot of that truly, what is the organization like? You know, for example, one other small company kind of trying that out is they, they divided the 70-30 rule. 70% 70 of the time is spent for you doing your role within your organization or business unit. 30% is dedicated to cross-functional team activities or centers of excellence. So we, we're seeing a shift in the way of working um, as more of how do these things all come together and how do we kind of step out of just the customer experience and really think about how we embed it everywhere else. So that's my takeaway. In a similar vein, thinking about cross-functional teams, I think about the fact that organizations are increasingly becoming more and more matrix, where you might have a single individual reporting into two different disciplines or with you know, the, the dotted line, so to speak, from one to another. Um, within uh, Marriott, for example, we have uh, our global brand team. So each brand has a dedicated team focused on um, you know, everything from the fonts and the logos to the marketing of that brand, to the development of new hotels within that brand, but they have connection through a dotted line with a team focused on learning and development for that brand. So think about all of those programs that we've already talked about so far to train our employees. Um, that all gets flavored again in the language of talent and stars and ladies and gentlemen, et cetera. So we've got all of these teams and we've got the operations component, the people who figure out what are the little shampoo bottles or now the big shampoo bottles in your mm -hmm. guest room the towels, the linens, the paint on the walls, but all these teams that connect. Um, and so you create those cross-functional pods. And I guess bridging the Hank's question to Lou's question, it makes it e all the more important for there not just to be leadership to employee recognition, but for there to be peer-to-peer -peer recognition, especially between colleagues who would traditionally have worked in separate teams, but who are now coming together. That's a great answer. That that cross pod, that that pod experience is when I have seen it work well, it works wonderfully well, and it breaks those silos down. I think the silos. I, I'm not going to go here and say that the silos will never exist, but I think we're continuing to see a crumbling of the silos as companies recognize we're more focused on it. If I can use some of our CX language, a jobs to be done function. And I don't really care whether you came up in marketing or whether you came up in finance or whatever. If you have the skills and the role that are needed to achieve whatever this objective is that's in front of us, and we have this shared job to be done, then we're going to come together in a pod for whatever period of time is needed to achieve that objective, then that pod will dissolve and a new one will, will rise up again. And so that is, it, I'm seeing much more of that. I've seen it successful at places that I've worked in the past. I saw it at my last client where we were able to deliver 
really quick value by do assembling in that pod model. And I think definitions of HR or CX that are so rigid as they have been in the past will, will increasingly dissolve over time by the companies that want to actually just get stuff done. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a, back to our theme. That's a recognition of the value you're creating for the employee mm -hmm. um, because being a part of a cross-functional team. I mean, I know in my career, early in my career, I was blessed to be able to be part of some of those cross-functional teams um, early on when it wasn't the cool thing to do. Um, and I learned so much that as a, now a generalist where I can go and talk about master data or process design or <laughs> supply chain, um, having been exposed to all of that really, to me, made me more valuable for being able to impact an organization. So when we recognize that and help an employee recognize you're not just part of a cross-functional team, you're, you're building skill sets to be a generalist with a deep knowledge in one area, that's highly valuable. So recognizing that and saying being a part, like I talked about the cross-functional team earlier, recognizing that collaboration, but also what it did for each individual and what they did, probably wouldn't recognize themselves as being a longer term benefit. Um, so that's a different type of recognition and helping them to get the light bulb to come on about. That wasn't just about us achieving something cross-functionally, there was a purpose for you behind that. What, what do you guys feel is the greatest measurement? We, we always talk about measuring customer experience. What's, what's the greatest metric measurement modality for, for looking at whether uh, an employee recognition program is successful or it's having good impact on the business? Don't tell me net promoter score. Long-term <laughs> talent, long-term talent. Yeah, your turnover rates, I would look at those, especially, I think it depends on, on the, the organization and the industry to a certain yeah. extent. So if you've got uh, an organization or an industry with more stability, um, I would probably lean towards more uh, office-based white collar roles, that, that tenure that Diane's speaking to. Um, in industries like hospitality, where there's so much frontline turnover, we look religiously at turnover rates. And it's noticeable when there are organizations that have the stronger cultures that in, in large part are influenced through recognition where those turnover rates will, they'll still always exist, but they'll be a little bit lower. And if you're having a hard time with your executives and thinking about recognition and the programs and getting funding for it, you can talk about the cost of acquisition of talent, the amount of training that it takes, the uptime and the service dip that we see as somebody comes on board, right? You, you learn to talk about that language to them because it's not just about, hey, we, you know, we need to recognize people. It's, it's all those things that, like you just talked about and the financial impact of those as well. In addition to the culture impact that tell both sides of the story, as I always say. Um, so that's an important piece too, if you're having trouble with why is that important? That's mm -hmm. a laundry list of things we need to do. Sounds good, let's go do it because they want to shake their head, but unless they see that impact and you're measuring and showing them the impact that it had, it's difficult to continue it. So yeah. let me stay with that for a second. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of tools out there. Um, and, and there's a nice question from Andrew in here. I think he's talking about one of the tools, Bonusly. Mm -hmm. uh, has anybody used Bonusly or, or are there other tools that uh, are effective when we're measuring or deploying employee recognition programs? I haven't used bonusly, but I'm definitely going to check that out after. Yeah. It's intriguing. Thank you for sharing that, Andrew. Yeah, I'm also, not familiar with that one either. Are there any other tools out there? And, you know, this is to the whole audience. Is there, are there any other tools or gamification uh, metric, you know, tools that you guys use? Point systems? Marlon, I was pausing for the audience. So audience talk over me if there was somebody about to say something. But one of the things that I've seen successfully used, and it's free, if you want to consider that you have already bought your internal communication channel. But to your point of gamification, it's badges. And so there's a lot of pride. I remember back, this is the 90s, I'm dating myself, but I remember being on a tour of Dell back in the 90s. And there were these little colored flags that would sit above people's cube if they had earned a particular achievement. At that time, it was a Six Sigma focused, uh, but it could have been any sort of achievement. 
and it was amazing to see how excited people were to have their little flags up over their cube. Well, the same thing can be uh, adopted. And I saw a question there about remote, but this question of what tools are out there in your internal employee communication forums, be that Slack, be that whatever, I think Yammer, if that's still around, you can attach little badges and people can earn badges that can be a part of their profile. And so it's, it's interesting to see how motivational a badge that is publicly visible or internally publicly visible can be to the employee from a recognition perspective. So that's a tool, if you want to call it that, that I've seen work particularly well. Uh, Rick, you've now gone to the 1990s and desk phones. So you have dated yourself. Yeah, sorry about that. It is kind of gray here. Sorry about that. The history lesson. Um, no, thanks. No, it's, it's a great idea. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, having come from Salesforce, very similar to what you're talking about, Rick, um, you know, they, they would literally put on stitched badges on, uh, on your, on your, your local sweater or, or vest, your pullover. Mm -hmm. And you'd see guys walking through the hallways that, you know, didn't have military badges on, but they had all of their Salesforce badges on all of their accomplishments, but it did drive friendly competition. Right. And it did drive uh, great outcomes. So. And it, it showed what the company valued. So if they were, and this is not expensive, what we're talking about. And that's why I'm saying, yes, haha, about the, uh, certainly the, the nineties and the gray beard and, and mm -hmm. the, the stitch badges. And we are returning, you know, some are returning to workforce. So the physical presence of celebration is not going away, but for those that need to stay in the digital space, those tools are available. There's nothing that really prevents that same model of public celebration in a digital space from going forward using those tools. Yeah. Now, as you're talking about badges and things affixed to, to uniforms and clothing, I, I think about a real fundamental, simple way that you can recognize people at, at, at um, most hospitality organizations, but Disney in particular, have name badges. You know, super simple, super straightforward. Everybody's got a name. Everybody working in the Disney company has to work in Disney parks. You could work at the yeah. or bank. You have a name badge with your first name on it. And just being able to, to say somebody's first name, acknowledge you one-to-one, -one, and, and occasionally affix little pins and things like that here and there to your badge as you gain loyalty or awards and recognition. Um, yeah, there's I, I can't think of an easier way in a large organization where not everybody might know each other to build that culture of recognition and, and having somebody with a personal identity. Yeah, it, it does come back to the psychological personal worth um, yeah. conversation and, and small things like that. Uh, I work with one company that, you know, it's, it's been a little bit different now that we're remote, but uh, they've already invested in just stickers to go on the back of the laptops now. Mm -hmm. Right. So as we get back into the office, um, something very simple, but that uh, recognize company values and dignifies people. Before we wrap, we've got seven minutes left. I'd like to thank Alec and Diane and Rick for just a wealth of, of knowledge and information and experience that you've shared with the audience. Again, uh, thank you so much. I'd like to open it up to the audience just one last time with seven minutes to go. Any, any other comments, suggestions, or questions that the audience may have? Hello? Hey, Eli. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Great, great panel, by the way. I definitely want to touch base on what you said, the working from home with the employee that kind of got tunnel vision and they lost that employee client um, relationship. It, it happens, right? I kind of experienced that on my last role as a senior advisor for a financial company. We dealt proposals and bankruptcies. When you work from home for so long and you're used to being in your own environment, you lose that sense of, you know, it's the employee professionalship. So I definitely agree. That was a very good point that was made. It's supposed to be in the office. You have your TL, you have your floor support, you have your managers to keep that in check. So that was a very good point. I like that. Thank you, Eli. Appreciate that very much. Thank Thanks you. for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you as well. Any other comments, questions? Well, it's been another great session, and uh, I look forward to every one of these. Um, thank you again, Alec, Diane, Rick. Um, thank you, Mark and Rich, for hosting and putting this forum together. It is meant to draw us closer together as practitioners in the field, and uh, we get closer and closer and have more and more uh, uh, ideas and great conversation every time we get together. So we're going to wrap today's session. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend and look for the next community event to be announced soon to come.
Take care. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.